I'm now going to move on to the rest of the platform of this, um, the rest of the speakers of this first platform. We're going to hear next from um, Catherine West MP, who I know is part of the Friends of Palestine yes. support in the uh, British Parliament, and she's going to give us some response to Trump's from Westminster. So it's a real pleasure to be back at SOAS. I too am an alumna of SOAS. This is where I did my Chinese politics degree um, back in 2002. Um, and I can tell you that there's a lot that hasn't changed. I think all the loos and the, the corridors and everything are the same. So um, it's, it's really good to be back. And could I congratulate Carol and the team for putting on such a lovely um, afternoon. And uh, I'm very pleased that it's being taped and hopefully be able to put the speeches up as well so that other people who may have liked to have been here but are still suffering from the January blues uh, haven't been able to get here. Um, and also just to congratulate Carol and the team on some excellent events this year. I thought Hiroshima Day with the film at Friends House was great um, and attracted a lot of young people and also our event in Parliament. Um, and it is lovely to see more young people joining up. We just have to think more carefully about the fora in which young people like to participate because maybe they don't like, maybe they have other ways of, of kind of connecting. You might be aware that lots of young people are now choosing to study politics at university and MPs are being flooded with young people asking to do shadowing and being part of elections and all sorts. So we are really living in a time of, um, of great political interest and I think CND should really be at the forefront of that. So um, I do hope that this year we put on some more members. Um, and in particular, I'm very happy to you know, do another set of tours of Parliament, if that interests young people, um, and just continue to be active and have plenty going on. It's also a pleasure to share the platform with Hussain, whom I had the pleasure of meeting in Ramallah when I was there with the Centre for Arab and British Understanding and the uh, Medical Aid for Palestine, who run tours for members of, members of Parliament. Um, and it was wonderful for me to understand more fully just what's going on today, because I was in um, that region in 1988 as a backpacker. Um, and sadly, so many things have gone backwards in terms of rights and um, a lot of sense of despair. But equally, a lot of really important human rights organisations which are setting up, like Betzalem and um, uh, not shattering the peace. Who do I mean? There's certain people who have been active in military service and have now come out. Combatants for peace. Yes, and have come out of being serving in the military in Israel and are very committed to telling their stories. And there seems to me to be a lot of sort of cross-community talking, which I think is fantastic, because like Jeremy and his quest for peace, I think it's very important that we see peace as the goal, and the way to do that is to make sure that everybody understands that inequality and unfairness is bad for everybody, not just certain communities. So um, it's fantastic to, uh, to, to, to share the platform with you, and also to have you here with us in the UK after the disgraceful um, treatment by the leadership of the US in Washington to you, towards yourself and your family. And I know, because we all have great American friends, how embarrassing that is for the average American um, who is so friendly and kind and welcoming mm -hmm. to treat um, Hussein and his family in that way, to disrupt the children's schooling and to have a sense of, you know, that's it, the mission's closed. Um, and he just is a very rude individual, <laughs> Mr. Trump. Um, so I could be too. <laughs> <laughs> One of the lasting images I have, though, of 2018, as we're in January, is actually the photograph of Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel together at Compiègne in the north of France, remembering the 9 million combatants and 7 million civilians who died in World War I which was then called, of course, the war to end all wars. And that image of the two leaders in that particular region, which of course has meant so much to us and to our sort of generation, seeing them in reconciliation did give one a bit of a sense of hope. And I think the important thing about all of this is to try and find that sense of hope when things feel a bit hopeless. Um, 
and that has um, I've just been trying to hold that image in my mind as something which we can hold on to as we think about the last hundred years and of course there's a lot to be said for the hundred years which Hussein mentioned and of course that's been so eventful and so difficult and sad for Palestinian communities but it's also been a, a hugely important hundred years um, for Europe as well. Now, um, we're not short of autocratic leaders um, at the moment, are we? Um, and, you know, obviously, Mr. Trump is not the only autocratic leader. We know that um, Mohammed bin Salman or Mr. Erdogan, the president of Turkey, or Xi Jinping, who's just made himself the core leader of China, they are all, or Mr. Putin of Russia, they're all the sort of same style of leadership. And I'm not sure what it is in the air which has created this particular kind of strong man um, figurehead. Um, but today's talk, of course, is mainly about the US, but it is important to remember that Mr. Trump seems to be sort of in a group of very strong men. So um, just briefly looking at the year sort of in um, the last 12 months, we did see a few rays of hope with Korea. Um, obviously, we're still waiting for the final ceasefire from 1950, the Korean War. And I don't know if you enjoyed seeing the scenes of the, the yeah. South Koreans and North Koreans meeting over the DMZ. Mm -hmm. And I think for all of you who have campaigned for so long for peace, I think that was for me a moment of hope. Um, about 18 months ago, I met the president of the um, parliament of South Korea who came to London. It was just before all of this kicked off when the rhetoric was starting to get really worrying. And he just said, I don't think in my lifetime there's ever going to be anything which moves us closer. And then about a month later, suddenly, mm -hmm. there they were meeting, families meeting for the first time since the 1950s. And I think that's just such an important thing to hold on to, that those of us who do campaign for peace, we can see these exciting developments. So um, looking a little bit more in detail, and I don't want to steal any of Anne's thunder, who's an expert in this field, but obviously the US's 2017 to 2018 nuclear posture review is rather troubling. Um, it's very assertive in tone and moves away from a vision of disarmament towards the notion of deterrence. And we all know that that's just for the competing country against country, nation against nation, and building up arms rather than reducing them. And specifically, the review promotes new, flexible, non-strategic options into the US nuclear inventory in order to provide tailored deterrence. The idea that many nuclear weapons could ever be regarded as appropriate in any circumstance is anathema. The nuclear posture review also confirms that ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is no longer a policy of the US administration, a deeply disappointing development. As former Secretary of State George Shultz said in a Senate hearing, a nuclear weapon is still a nuclear weapon. You use a small one, then you go on to a bigger one. I think nuclear weapons are nuclear weapons and you need to draw a line there. So it's deeply worrying to see the abdication of the US leadership on crucial questions of disarmament and non-proliferation. The approach taken by Mr. Trump inhibits compliance with arms control obligations. There are no firm proposals to take forward the work begun under Barack Obama to begin negotiations with Russia on the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, or START. Without those negotiations and that crucial dialogue between Russia and the US, there's a worrying lack of progress on tackling proliferation. Mm. And in the UK, we have a major debate on Brexit and our role in the world. Mm. And at the same time, the rise <coughs> of the far right. A third of all domestic terrorist plots currently under investigation by the Home Office come from the far right. Women MPs cannot speak to the media outside Parliament without abuse of a sexist nature by far-right activists. Ethnic minority MPs are attacked online by the same thugs for the colour of their skin. Brexit and the potential fragmentation of Europe 
is deeply unhelpful to peace and cooperation. So many appear to have forgotten the terrible lessons of a hundred years ago when our region was at war. And putting peace at risk in search of a nostalgic pursuit of empire is backwards looking and wrong headed. Post Brexit trade policy, while it may contain some opportunities, will undoubtedly rely much more heavily on arms sales to countries like Saudi Arabia, who have shown through the Yemen conflict that they have no qualms about using conventional weaponry purchased from the UK and the US to inflict civilian casualties. And the UK will be so much more dependent on this sort of trade policy if Brexit goes ahead. Labour in opposition has been clear that its policy on Yemen is to suspend arms sales to Saudi, to draw a line under the dreadful loss of life, and do it all it can to support the ending of the blockade which is inflicting widespread famine on thousands of Yemeni civilians. And I'm very pleased too that under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, he's appointed a shadow minister for peace and disarmament to focus on supporting the resolution of the Israel-Palestine conflict to bring peace to Cyprus, Colombia, and other parts of the globe which have known deeply unresolved conflicts over decades. Labour's policy is to have the UK adequately represented at UN level and to provide desperately needed leadership on arms control, to halt dangerous proliferation of deadly weapons, and to promote peace through collaboration at an international level. No more empty <coughs> sharing of disarmament conferences at the UN, which is this government has done regularly since 2010. Instead, Labour will take a proactive stance on promoting peace and stability and getting into the nitty gritty detail of disarmament at international level. To conclude, there have been some glimmers of hope this year. A dialogue has begun on the Korean Peninsula a fragile peace conference has taken place between the warring factions in the Yemeni conflict. But so much more needs to be done, not just at international level, but at the grassroots, as Hussein said, to encourage young people to join CND and debate the great questions of the day, and for each of us to play our part to scrutinize our own government and its lack of action on peace and disarmament, and to work towards a Labour government which will have a commitment at its heart to further peace and disarmament. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I think many of us, at least many of the women in this room, are, have got our own idea of how to counteract a growth in strong men. And that's a growth in strong women. Mm, mm. We've just heard from Which one. is scary, really. I'm now <laughs> going to introduce another. Um, Anne Feltham from the Campaign Against Arms Trade. Over to you, Anne. Do you want to... In that case, turn your mic off. Oh, is that that's that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me along. Um, I've been asked to talk about on sales to Saudi Arabia. Oops. Now, yeah. I noticed several cat supporters in the room at the moment, um, and others who I've spoken on this topic to before. So, apologies if you already know most of this. And like the other two speakers, I do have some hope for the future, but I'll leave that to the end of my talk. You probably know that the current military campaign by the Saudi-led coalition in um, Yemen, that campaign started in March 2015, so it's now been going on for nearly four years. And in that time, tens of thousands of people have been killed. Nobody's exactly sure how many, um, but many tens of thousands. Many, many more have been displaced, and the UN says it's the world's worst humanitarian disaster out of a population of about 27 million, 22 million are dependent on humanitarian assistance. So it's very, very disastrous in the area. And it's the poorest country in that Gulf region by far already. And now it is absolutely terrible. And throughout that time, from about May 2015, a couple of months after the war conflict started, 
There have been numerous reports by bodies such as UN expert panels, Human Rights Watch and the aid agencies. And they've all reported many instances of violations of international humanitarian law. Now, the UK government openly admits um, that UK produced fighter jets and UK made bombs and missiles are being used by Saudi Arabia against Yemen. And yet, the government has neither stopped issuing more licenses for the export of such equipment, nor has it revoked the existing ones. Now, anybody who wants to export military equipment from the UK has to have an export license. And these export license applications need to be considered against specific European Union and UK national criteria. And one of those criteria is that licenses should not be granted where there is a clear risk the equipment might be used in a serious violation of international humanitarian law. So you would have thought that this would have ruled out the issue of any more export licenses for goods to go to Saudi Arabia for use in Yemen and that they should have revoked the existing ones. But no, that has not happened. So back in 27, 2015, sorry, very shortly after the war started, CAT started its legal process, formal yeah. legal process, um, against the UK government, issuing a legal challenge saying it wasn't abiding by its own rules. It takes a very long while legally, and the High Court didn't hear our case until February 2017. And then in July 2017, Campaign Against Arms Trade heard it had lost its case. It was a loss that CAT, and indeed most of the legal commentators who have written about it since, believe get, they, this judgment gave the high, the high Court gave the government far too much discretion. It was almost as if none of the international arms export regimes existed. So the UK government makes quite a lot about playing by international rules, but in this case it seems not to have done. So Campaign Against Arms Trade put in for an appeal, and this will now be heard in April 2019. It moves so slowly. Now, so how did this all happen? Successive UK governments, right back to... 1966, have, when an arms export agency, government arms export agency, was first established, have made military export promotion a real priority. And it's this promotion of arms sales that's always trumped any controls that have been put on. So it's always that um, the promotion has taken precedence over control. And that's to say, that's been going on since 1966, at least. And over half of UK arms supplies go to the Middle East, and Saudi Arabia is by far and away the largest customer for UK arms. But not only do these arms provide Saudi Arabia with deadly means, as we're seeing in Yemen, they also render UK governments, successive UK governments, desperate for further deals, silent or very muted when it comes, out to, speak, it comes to speaking out against Saudi Arabian human rights abuses. The real trade with Saudi Arabia began in the 1960s, but it notched up a whole kind of in volume in the 1980s. That was when, though encouraged by the US, the UK looked to arms sales to recycle Saudi oil wealth. The US itself didn't want to pursue, pursue arms deals with um, Saudi Arabia, because of the pro-Israel lobby in the United States. So it really left it to France and the UK to battle it out for those deals. And the UK won them. The two big contracts with Saudi Arabia were the Al Yamama one from the mid-1980s, when Tornado and Hawk jets were supplied by a company that's now BA Systems. And then later, there's been the Salaam project, which is, covers the Eurofighter typhoons. And again, BA Systems is the main contractor. These projects always take a long while to um, draw up and then f finalise. But that one started, the Salam project started in um, about 2007. 
and it was um, finalised in 2014. All these contracts include the aircraft, but very vitally, both for the money that they're paying for them and for the support for the war in Yemen, they also include ongoing support and servicing. For the contracts, BA Systems gets UK government support. Margaret Thatcher, Tony Blair, David Cameron, especially as Prime Ministers gave their support to these deals. In 2014, when um, they couldn't really finalise that Salam project, the finances were kind of proving a problem. Prince Charles went over to Saudi Arabia and did some sword dancing, and two days later, the Saudis signed on the dotted line. Um, it, when Prince Charles turned 70 at the end of last year, one of the reports did say that he was now refusing to assist with arms sales in the Middle East. I don't know if that's true or not. Obviously, he doesn't make an announcement on that grounds, but certainly the royal family has been very much involved, or some members of the royal family have been very much involved in these deals. These deals are government-to-government -government contracts, um, which means that the UK has a direct contract with Saudi Arabia, but then the UK government also has a back-to-back -back contract with BAE Systems as the main, the main contractor. So they're very much a government and industry contract. There are about 240 Ministry of Defence, civil servants and mil uh, military personnel working in the UK and in Saudi Arabia to support the contracts. Um, these civil servants and military personnel are actually paid for by the Saudi government, but they are working within the UK civil service and military structures. There are also um, 6,100 BA Systems employees working in Saudi Arabia in kind of quotes, supporting the operational capabilities of the Royal Saudi Air Force. Now, some of these 6,100 employees of BA Systems in Saudi Arabia will be Saudi nationals, but there's also a huge um, expat community of UK nationals. And one question mark that we haven't actually been able to find the answer to is whether these BA Systems employees, the UK ones, based in Saudi Arabia, are actually loading missiles onto the planes for use in Yemen. We do know that they are supervising that loading, but they, it's, it's sort of not exactly clear whether or not they are loading. So it's very much a case of the UK government working together with the arms industry. But remember, BA Systems is a commercial company, so its primary concern is shareholder profit. But again, you have to remember unless you've asked for an ethical pension or you're in a, um, somewhere where you can um, influence where the pension investments goes, it is likely that the pension investments you have will be involved in BA systems and others. It isn't fat cats who benefit from this. They're very much part of the financial structures more generally. As the UK's biggest customer for arms, um, Saudi Arabia has been a consistent focus for the campaign against arms trade. Until 2015 and the war in Yemen, our focus was on the lack of human rights in Saudi Arabia. Even if the equipment is not used, as I said, then there's still a strong message of support going with the sale to the Saudi Arabian government. But the, size, the real size of the UK arms trade with Saudi Arabia that also means that the UK government will do everything it can to keep selling. It's selling, I mean, even I'm shocked that it keeps selling with the disaster of Yemen going on. Where, at the same time as the arms are going out, the Department for International Development is trying to pick up the pieces and support the Yemeni civilians. It doesn't make sense. So there's been pressure to end arms exports to Saudi Arabia for decades and to no avail. Some of that pressure is paying off internationally now. There are embargoes or restrictions from several European countries um, on Saudi Arabia. Sometimes they're not quite what it seems. Germany has had 
has announced embargoes several times, but it only seems there are two-month pauses and then they start again. Some other countries, it only seems as if it's future licences and they've already licensed all the equipment so they can foresee going there. But at least a public statement is being made in some of these countries saying we don't want to sell to Saudi Arabia at the moment. So the pressure has not borne on the current government and doesn't look as if it will. I think some of us thought that when um, Boris Johnson ceased to be Foreign Secretary, um, we might have... A, Jeremy Hunt came in, there might be a small window of an opportunity there, but it's passed. So it doesn't look as if that will happen. But to end on that positive note, I promised. The disaster of Yemen, plus the murder of Khashoggi, has drawn real attention to the nature of the Saudi regime. And taken together, they mean far more people are now questioning the arms trade than I've known in the many, many years I've been working for Campaign Against Arms Trade. And that includes more politicians. And Catherine's mentioned the um, Labour Party opposition to arms sales to Saudi Arabia. I think we can say pretty well all the opposition parties are united in calling for an end to arms sales to Saudi Arabia. And the media also seems to be kind of questioning the sales more. In fact, I couldn't believe that the Khashoggi thing drew more attention and got more comment than all the deaths of the people in Yemen. But I've been told by other people that actually that's been very, very influential in allowing the mainstream media to be more critical of the Saudi regime. So it's creating opportunities um, um, that weren't there before. And I think it's very much you need that questioning that's happening now. It's the first step to really ending this deadly trade. So thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Thanks very much for that, Anne. And I completely agree with the sentiment that Saudi Arabia and Britain's arms sales are now back on the agenda. But I think part of the reason that it's there and that so much is known is thanks to Anne and her colleagues in Campaign Against the Arms Train. <laughs> I'm now going to, um, to take 10 minutes or so of question and answer to Catherine and to Anne. You, madam. Um, apart from the um, BAA shareholders, who, how does this government benefit from all the money they're getting from, uh, from arms sales? And I think we need to know, is it individuals in the government who are soaking it up? Or, I don't see any help for the NHS with all this extra money we're getting in. I don't see any help for teachers or education or transport. So how are we, the people, benefiting from the proceeds? I'm going to take two or three and then ask you to come back. At the back, the gentleman at the back. Um, first of all, uh, <coughs> addressing Catherine West, uh, you mentioned about the commemoration of World War I. Between um, and with Van um, Angelum and Circle and uh, the French uh, people. But you didn't mention anything about the fact that it was France and Britain that perpetrated the Balfour Declaration and which uh, set up a tra whole train of events um, with the culmination of the State of Israel. It, uh, you know, emerging in 1948. Um, the other question is relating to uh, the second speaker, Anne Kelton. Is um, was she aware that uh, Andrew Feinstein uh, wrote a very good book called Dark World uh, on the c corruption that went on at all levels? of government and the arms business um, in, in the years preceding the BAE, the BAE uh, contracts. Okay, thanks. And a third question before we move on. You, young man. Um, so this is Catherine West. Yes. Um, would you in your Labour policy consider actually revoking current arms and current contracts 
with Saudi Arabia. Um, so they don't have anything to fight against Yemen with. Would he be happy to break current contracts mm -hmm. already had with Yemen if a Labour government were to come in? Right. Thank you. Um, can I take Catherine and then Anne? Is that OK, that order? On the question of the Balfour Declaration, um, I think the important thing to remember is that's why British MPs have a really special duty to travel to Palestine, the West Bank, um, and to understand the conflict there. What I've noticed, I've been an MP coming up for four years, um, it is the most sort of, if you like, popular foreign affairs issue in Parliament. When we have a debate, it's very packed. Lots of people take an interest. Um, and I feel because of the history, the special history, we do have a special commitment to the area. And I'm very pleased that we've put a lot of pressure on the current government as opposition members um, to remember that period and also to make sure that our policy is different from the US's, as Hussein mentioned, you know, with the pressure that there must be from Trump on the current government. They have actually tried to stick to the policy, um, and we do have a lot of Arabist experts in the Foreign Office, and I've been pleased that at least some of that pressure has remained. It's not perfect, and you're quite right to remember that the 100 years, 1918, is memorable for both things. Um, but I feel, having visited the region now, that it's really important to take that work back to Parliament. Um, and I've had constituency events in my own constituency to focus on the humanitarian issues and also just to keep you know, that policy area on the agenda. As you know, the Middle East now has so many different conflicts, so Libya, Iraq, um, rights for the Kurds, and yet the Palestine-Israel question is still very much in the uppermost, certainly in Labour members' minds. Um, and I think that's, we do have to redouble our efforts to make sure that we keep it on the agenda. And I think that it's great that CND chose to have Hussein here today. And I think he's really very articulate. He's excellent. And he's basically, there's a program of speaks, speeches that he's going to be making in Parliament. And the Labour Friends of Palestine in Parliament is the most kind of proactive and well, um, you know, very popular group in Parliament, because I sit on quite a lot of all-party groups. So the all-party Korea group, <laughs> get about three members. But if there's an event on Palestine, we get, you know, maybe 30 or 40 people speaking in a debate. So, you know, I think you're quite right to remember to talk about the 1918 um, Balfour Declaration, but also, I think, just making sure that with everything else that's going on in the region, that we don't forget and that we keep it very much in our minds. Um, and there was another question, what was it? Um, yeah, um, I sit on the arms um, committee in Parliament, um, which is interesting. It's made up of the Foreign Office Select Committee, the International Trade Select Committee, which I sit on, um, the Defence Select Committee, and the um, DFID, International Development. And all those committees, they put forward four members. So um, I've got to know quite a lot, and Anne and some of the other experts have been briefing us as, as members of parliament on um, you know, how we would implement Labour's policy. And Emily Thornbury, who's the Shadow Foreign Secretary, has said on a number of occasions that under a Labour government, we will suspend the arms trade to Saudi. Now, the actual practicalities of doing that will require a lot of legalities because obviously a contract, when you enter a contract, it's difficult to break that without a big penalty. But together with NGOs and also with clever civil servants, you can enact these policies. It's very important that we do it in the best way possible, but um, we are committed to doing that. So thank you for the question. And uh, you know, I hope that we have a Labour government very soon so that we can do it immediately. Thanks. Um. Was just um, you mentioning the committees and um, those committee that committee has representatives from the committees that shadow the departments which are involved in arms export licensing, but there's a strange anomaly in that, in that the Department for International Trade 
only gets involved when exports are actually going to um, the countries that are receiving international aid. Now, of course, the actual arms being dropped on Yemen are going to a country that's not receiving international aid. So the Department for International Development will be picking up the pieces in Yemen, but it's actually not being involved in these export licensing decisions, which is one of the crazier things um, that I forgot to mention earlier that is going on. I was asked about money from arms sales. Well, the money from arms sales, they're private companies, so the money goes to, the, money goes to the shareholders in the form of dividends. The, the public purse only benefits from taxation of the company and obviously the people it employs pay income tax and national insurance and things. It's, there's no specific return from the arms industry. So these big deals that you hear mentioned, that's the money that's going to BAE Systems or the other companies. And in fact, the arms companies receive subsidies, particularly in forms of research and development, but also some specific subsidies in the export, the export promotion agency, for instance. There's kind of various um, subsidies out there. And one of the reasons that the arms industry gets quite a lot of support, I think, is because it's one of the remaining few traditional sort of manufacturing industries that exist in the UK now that most of the other manufacturing industries from Thatcher onwards have disappeared. So, in a way, it's a choice of governments to continue to subsidise and support the arms industry. And we have argued very strongly that if that support was switched, if that support was given to, for instance, renewables, then there could be more jobs created. And, of course, it would... Um, be a more peace could be a more peaceful world and also tackle some of the real challenges to our security such as climate change so we think it's a win-win situation to switch the support give it to somewhere else and I would say another very thing that's giving me huge hope at the moment is that the kind of pressure for arms conversion or defense diversification is growing enormously and the TUC is backing or putting pressure on the Labour Party to set up a shadow defence diversification agency. And um, North West Labour Party, which is the area of the Labour Party, which actually includes some of the very big arms industries, such as Barrow and the big BA systems aircraft factories um, near Preston, that has passed a motion now in support of the Labour Party setting up a shadow defence <laughs> diversification agency. It's something I've spent a lot of time on at the moment. It's a real hopeful move. Andrew Feinstein, I've known him since about a month. He set foot in the UK when he left South Africa. Um, worked with him on a lot of things. He's very inspirational. The book is called Shadow World. It's great. There's a film of the book. Um, yes. So, um, yes, he's a great ally to have in challenging the arms trade and unearthing the various um, corruption that goes along with the arms sales, which he did to start with, for those who don't know him, because as a member of the South African Parliament, he um, came under a lot of pressure to keep quiet about the arms purchases that were made by the ANC party, of which he was a member, in the immediate post-apartheid era, when they could have been spending on a tackling HIV AIDS or providing housing. They were instead being persuaded by European arms companies with the help of a few backhanders to spend money on an arm rearmament programme. Andrew was scandalised by this and in the end left the ANC, left South Africa, and he's, he's been a great ally ever since. So do encourage, if you've got an opportunity to hear him speak, do ask him. So thanks to the ambassador who's already left. Thank you to Catherine and thank you to Anne for making it such an interesting session. Um, join me in saying thank you. Thank you very much. Both of you.